I think about refugees, uh, refugee animals seeking out their last pieces of habitat and indeed the wider global impact of refugees who will have to leave places which were once fertile uh, and are now not because of climate change. There, there is a dilemma when one thinks about all the ecological aspects. Uh, here we are on a carbon-guzzling ship, having flown a long way to an extremely remote and delicate and pristine place. My sense of, you know, these were places that really shouldn't have people going down to them because it was a place where nature shouldn't be disturbed and sort of like not having a right to go. My name is Mark Adams. I've uh, been a teacher for most of my career of all three sciences. Uh, I've spent a lot of time talking about ecological systems and so on. I taught, uh, if you add it all together, 43 complete school years and I'm nearing retirement. I'm Nancy. I am retired and I do some voluntary work and spend a lot of time walking, gardening, gazing, um, working for a couple of charities. And we've lived here in Scotland for about 30 years. I've never seen frozen ocean before. I've never seen a glacier before. I'm sorry in a sense that I'm retiring because I won't immediately be able to use this experience at the school I currently teach. To go up to the Arctic areas, it's something that I think I would never have thought I would do. Svalbard seems to me to be Scotland on steroids in the sense that everything is ten times bigger and ten times colder and ten times uh, more dramatic in terms of the geology. So we come to this extraordinary area where above the waves we see some dramatic effects. feel that we've pretty much reached a tipping point now in terms of climate and we need to put in place plans to, to limit further damage to the atmosphere. And the very fact that at 81 degrees north I'm able to sit out in the sunshine on deck in four degrees temperature, even if it's July, is in itself a rather remarkable aspect. I've bought a little sketchbook and some watercolours and been paying attention to colours and rock formations and sea states. It's been really uh, a wonderfully therapeutic thing to do. The scale of the open waters and the scale of the ice and the scale of the icebergs and the scale of the glaciers has surprised me because you never get a sense of scale from looking at a photograph.
predator around me. They, the, the, the chicks would just freeze. Uh, the breeding site at certain times. It, they sort of flock and mass together and fly in. Our confusion is yeah. I think perhaps the most moving moment was when we sighted a blue whale. To really clock the size of it and have in the back of one's mind the intelligence which that creature probably has and the distances that creature has swum and the places it's been. It was really a breathtaking moment to actually have the privilege of seeing it. It was extraordinary. What's really astonishing about the wildlife is that they take extremely little notice of us yellow-coated humans. One of the best examples of that was the little Arctic fox, which we watched coming up a little ravine in front of a hundred people with a hundred cameras. It's a remarkable thing. And then the polar bears the next day. from the hill and walked right alongside the ship. That was a remarkable experience. So I didn't take any notice of this from the other side. It's extraordinary. I just think it's amazing. We are so fortunate. It's such an extraordinary experience to be in the habitat of nature and be an observer rather than a participant. So I feel overwhelmed and very, very privileged. I could weep. You are. I know what I am. Until you actually have it happen in your presence or until you actually experience it yourself, it, it's a story. And when it happens to you, then it becomes your story. You could hear all sorts of other people's stories about what they experience, and it registers in the brain. I think what happens is that when you have your own experience like that, it registers in the soul. You find yourself fine-tuning your senses. Everything is so much more vivid, I think. There's a sense of being attentive and paying attention rather than the mind drifting to other things. That sense of being, being able to be very focused for a period of time on where we are, what we're doing, who we're with, and not being worried or concerned about what's going on elsewhere.
landscapes, color, shape, texture, and how they shift and change with the light. The various hues of green and blue that perhaps because of the clarity of the light, they're so much more intense. For some, not being connected to the web makes them feel more connected to nature and each other in a remote place like this. There's something about the wordless experiences, you know, things you can't put into words. Yes. Yes. There's actually someone living there, but they've gone away for a walk while we're all around. And now to watch it crumble before our eyes just by freeze thaw. A tiny jot of time in geological terms. It's all rather wonderful. A fly! How exciting! I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure. It'll probably come under the mite family. Look at this. Isn't that amazing? It actually smells like some of the best honey ever, but wasted. Wasted because they're allegedly wind pollinated. wasted on me. Oh God, the fragrance is incredible. I wish I was still teaching because there are so many great examples here of micro habitat. Those slightly damper patches here have a completely different flora. Incredible. Show people. I sometimes wondered if two weeks might be too long, and it hasn't been at all. And it's been just over a week, and I think I could easily spend a month away um, with each day being something different and each day enabling a little bit more reflection about my place in this world as I get older. I'll miss the fact that there's a whole boatload of people that have such kindness about them and that you're sharing a similar experience so that almost words are not necessary. So. My whole attitude shifted, of course, knowing it provides the opportunity for people, ordinary people, to get a much deeper sense of what does connect us north and south.
we must take the message back to the places we all live and uh, say we need to be really, really careful here. I'm just completely astonished that uh, the evolution of life is very, very much more sophisticated than we understand. It's a co-evolution of species together with the landscape and the climate. I suppose this is all a curious mixture of examples of immense fragility of an ecosystem but also immense robustness in that it will recover, even in the sense that the Earth may throw us off and manage perfectly well without us. We'll just be a tiny moment in time. But the snow buntings might be fine. There's one right there. Lots of eider ducks and babies. Oh yes, the red ones. Yeah. We've been looking at those. Yes, they're spiders or mites. M-I-T-E-S. Arets in Scotland. That's the, the pointy tops. I'm philosophizing about how ironic it is that how robust the ecosystem is in many senses and will do quite well without us. You know, a period of 10,000 years of massive global warming will be a problem for us, yeah. but not for most things really. They'll re 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 yeah. <laughs> recover. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in class, I use the analogy of an arm span outstretched. plants, dinosaurs about that crease there, humans a male filing there. Mm.